data uh, that two jabs of the vaccine, be it AstraZeneca or Pfizer, is so much more effective against that Delta variant. So he set new targets uh, to get every under 40 uh, one jab offered at least. Uh, and for the whole of the adult population, at least two thirds of us were to have two jabs uh, before he announced measures to unlock. Well, today we're expecting a bonfire of regulations, heavy briefing over the weekend that the government intends to lift loads of restrictions. Robert Jemrick on Sky uh, News yesterday on the Trevor Phillips show confirming uh, that mask coverings will not be mandatory. He himself, the community secretary, saying he didn't want to wear one. So a big bonfire of regulations. What will be interesting to see in this press conference is how does Sir Patrick Valance and Chris Whitty, uh, the two scientific advisers, uh, react to that? Um, there has been, let's say, divided opinion amongst the scientists about the uh, merits of completely doing away with so many restrictions when the case rate rates are rising so rapidly uh, in the UK. We now have more cases of coronavirus uh, in the UK than all of the EU. But the key to all of it is that the hospitalisation rates while going up uh, and the death uh, toll. Uh, there appears to be that break that they were looking between vaccination uh, and uh, exponential rates of growth in terms of hospitalizations uh, and people losing their lives. So let's see what the Prime Minister has to say. I think it will be quite a big bang approach. Yeah, Beth, it's Mark Austin here now, just uh, coming up to five o'clock when we expect to see uh, Boris Johnson. We're also going to see Chris Whitty and Patrick Balance, uh, Valance, I think. Does, does that suggest that this is something that the scientists will go along with? Well, I think the point of it is, Mark, that what Sir Patrick and Chris Whitty would say is that they're there to advise and give the options. Uh, and it's to the Prime Minister and his Cabinet to decide on what the policy should be. But if you want a taster uh, of where the government's mindset is at, uh, you could see it in terms of Sajid Javid, the new health secretary, uh, giving an announcement, or making an announcement rather via the Sunday newspapers, an opinion article he wrote in the Mail of Sunday. He said, I know many people will be cautious about easing restrictions, but no date we choose will ever come without risk. So we have to take a broad and balanced view. He went on to say, we're going to have to learn to accept the existence of COVID and find ways to cope with it just as we do the flu. And I think this really will be a moment today where the government say, we have been living through a pandemic for 16 months. We now have to learn to live with it and go back to normal life as we know it. Of course, there are so many questions about how long is normal? Is it over for good? Is this the end? What might happen? in the winter and, of course, what might happen with okay. new variants, given okay. Beth, how uh, all right, we're going to hold it there the case numbers and are. And we're going over to uh, uh, Boris Johnson. Joining us. Today, I want to set out what our lives would be like from the 19th of this month, which is only a few days away, if and when we move to step four, a, a decision uh, we will finally take on the 12th. And I want to stress from the outset that this pandemic is far from over. It certainly won't be over by the 19th. As we predicted in the roadmap in February, we're seeing cases rise fairly rapidly. There could be 50,000 cases detected per day by the 19th. And again, as we predicted, we're seeing rising hospital admissions. And we must reconcile ourselves, sadly, to more deaths from COVID. In these circumstances, we must take a careful and a balanced decision. And there's only one reason why we can contemplate going ahead to step four in circumstances where we'd normally be locking down further. And that's because of the continuing effectiveness of the vaccine rollout. When we paused step four a few weeks ago, we had two reasons. First, we wanted to get more jabs into people's arms, and we have with over 45 million adults now having received a first dose and 33 million a second. That is a higher proportion of the adult population of any European country except Malta. And our expectation remains that by July 19th, 
every adult will have had the chance to receive a first dose and two thirds will have received their second dose. And the second reason we paused was because we wanted a bit more time to see the evidence that our vaccines have helped to break the link between disease and death. And as the days have gone by, it has grown ever clearer that these vaccines are indeed successful with the majority of those admitted to hospital unvaccinated. And Chris and Patrick will show the data highlighting the greatly reduced mortality that the vaccines have achieved. So as we come to the fourth step, we have to balance the risks. The risks of the disease, which the vaccines have reduced, but very far from eliminated, and the risks of continuing with legally enforced restrictions that inevitably take their toll on people's lives and livelihoods, on, on people's health and mental health. And we must be honest with ourselves that if we can't reopen our society in the next few weeks, when we will be helped by the arrival of summer and by the, the school holidays, then we must ask ourselves, when will we be able to return to normal? And to those who say we should delay again, the alternative to that is to open up in winter uh, when the virus will have an advantage or not at all this year. And so, again, without preempting the decision on the 12th of July, let me set out today our five point plan for living with COVID in the hope that it will give families and businesses time to prepare. First, we will reinforce our vaccine wall, reducing the dose interval for under 40s from 12, uh, for under 40s from 12 weeks to eight, so that everyone over 18 should be double jabbed by the middle of September, in addition to our autumn programme of booster vaccines for the most vulnerable. Second, we will change the basic tools that we have used to control human behaviour. We'll move away from legal restrictions and allow people to make their own informed decisions about how to manage the virus. From step four, we will remove all legal limits on the numbers meeting indoors and outdoors. We will allow all businesses to reopen, including nightclubs. We will lift the limit on named visitors to care homes and on numbers of people attending concerts, theater, and sports events. We will end the one meter plus rule on social distancing and the legal obligation to wear a face covering, although guidance will suggest where you might choose to do so, especially when cases are rising and where you come into contact with people you don't normally meet in enclosed spaces, such as obviously crowded public transport. It will no longer be necessary for governments to instruct people to work from home. So employers will be able to start planning a safe return to the workplace. There will be no COVID certificate required as a condition of entry to any venue or event, although businesses and events can certainly make use of certification and the NHS app gives you a COVID pass as one way to show your COVID status. Third, we will continue from step four to manage the virus with a test, trace and isolate system that is proportionate to the pandemic. You will have to self-isolate if you test positive or are told to do so by NHS test and trace. But we're looking to move to a different regime for fully vaccinated contacts of those testing positive and also for children. And tomorrow, the Education Secretary will announce our plans to maintain key protections, but remove bubbles and contact isolation for pupils. Fourth, from step four, we will maintain our tough border controls, including the red list, and recognizing the protection afforded by two doses of vaccine, we will work with the travel industry towards removing the need for fully vaccinated arrivals to isolate on return from an amber country and the transport secretary will provide a further update later this week. Last, we will continue to monitor the data and retain contingency measures to help manage the virus during higher risk periods such as the winter. But we will place an emphasis 
on strengthened guidance and do everything possible to avoid reimposing restrictions with all the costs that they bring. As we set out this new approach, I'm mindful that today is the 73rd anniversary of our National Health Service, and there could not be a more fitting moment to pay tribute once again to every one of our NHS and social care workers. And the best thing we can do to repay their courage and dedication right now is to protect ourselves and others and get those jabs whenever our turn comes. Thank you very much. I'm now going to ask Patrick to do the slides. Thank you. Can I have the first slide, please? This slide shows the number of people testing positive for COVID from the 1st of September last year through to today. What you can see is that um, obviously we had a peak in November, a big peak around January and February, and we are in the middle now of another increase in cases. It's going quite steeply. The most recent seven-day average is 25,447 cases. Today, we saw 27,334. Uh, so the number of cases is increasing. The doubling time is roughly nine days. It's mainly amongst younger people, but spreading up the age groups. And the Office for National Statistics uh, estimate that Roughly one in 210 people are now infected with COVID, approximately a quarter of a million people. So there's no doubt we are now facing an increase in case numbers. Next, time, next slide, please. This slide shows the number of people in hospital. And again, it goes from the 1st of September through to now. And what you can see is that there was, again, the peak of hospitalisations in November and a big peak in January and February. But in contrast to the very sharp increase in cases, we have got an increase in the number of people in hospital, but it's not so steep. And you can see that there are, as of July the 1st, 1,905 people in hospital with COVID-19. 358 uh, people were admitted uh, yesterday. The doubling time is slower than for cases, so it's not rising as fast, but the hospitalizations are rising and rising quite steeply in some places, and we would expect them to continue. So essentially what this shows is that the vaccines have weakened the link between cases and hospitalization, but it's a weakened link, not a completely broken link and we will still see increases in hospitalisation. And as the cases get much higher, you would expect the hospitalisations to increase. Next slide, please. That is even more evident when we look at deaths. And again, the same slide format from the 1st of September through to the uh, 1st of, uh, th through to date. And what you can see is uh, the large number of deaths that occurred. And the first peak is illustrated in the dotted lines. You can see how it relates to the first peak. And if you go to the right hand part of the slide, you can see it's even difficult to see an increase in the number of deaths at the moment. But, and this is an important but, the deaths are increasing, they're at low levels, but there's an increase in deaths just as there's been an increase in hospitalisation. And we would expect that to continue also as the number of cases increases. So again, to reiterate, cases going up, the link between cases and hospitalisations and cases and deaths is weakened, but not completely broken. And we would expect to see some further increase. Next slide, please. The number of people who've received vaccination is high, of course, across the country, and that's true for both first and second dose. And overall, for first dose, something like 86% of the population over the age of 18 have had a first dose, and a larger number of people, because of the pause that was put in place, a larger number of people have now had second dose as well. So we've got a high level of vaccination coverage, again, making it more difficult for the virus to spread in these groups and protecting in terms of hospitalizations and deaths. And I think the message from this set of slides are twofold, really. First, if you haven't had a vaccination and you're eligible for one, get a vaccine. Make sure you get the second dose. And second, 
that we are in the face of an increasing epidemic at the moment and therefore we need to behave accordingly in terms of trying to limit transmission spread. Thank you. Thanks very much, Patrick. Anything to add at this stage, Chris? Thank you very much. Let's go, first of all, to members of the public. We have Aaron from Kent. We have figures which tell us how effective the vaccines are to hospitalisations and deaths. But how effective is the vaccine to prevent long COVID or lessen in its effects? Thank you. Uh, thanks, Aaron. I'm going to, I think, ask uh, our, our scientific... Uh, I'm going to ask Chris to, to ask, answer that. Thanks, Prime Minister. I mean, I think at the moment, Aaron, the, um, the data are not really clear. Uh, I think we are confident that because the vaccines uh, prevent people from getting COVID in a very high proportion of cases, that, of course, is a protection against uh, long COVID, uh, which is itself several different syndromes, almost certainly. Uh, and if lots of people are vaccinated, that reduces the risk of transmission in the community. Uh, it's one of the reasons why, uh, as the Prime Minister said, uh, vaccinating yourself protects yourself, but also those around you. So that also helps protect. But we do not yet know whether those people who have been vaccinated and then get uh, COVID, uh, whether it uh, weakens or breaks the link uh, between that and long COVID. And I think that, that th those data will come out uh, over the next few months. No, no, I think that's right. I mean, it, it, because um, vaccines reduce severe disease as well, and we know that some part of long COVID is associated in people who've had severe disease, I think there's a reasonable expectation that that bit's going to be diminished. And um, as Chris said, we'll find out um, over time the effects on the overall profile of long COVID. Thanks very much, Aaron. Anita from, from Greater London. Hello. You said that we will hopefully be able to live with COVID like flu and that we have a very good vaccination programme for flu. Presumably, part of the success of our flu vaccination programme is the inclusion of children. Therefore, will you be making the COVID vaccine available to all children should they wish to receive it in the near future? Thank you. Thanks, Anita. Well, I know that the JCVI is, is looking at uh, vaccinating uh, children. But Chris, would you like to answer that one? Uh, thank you. So it's, it's, it's a really important question. And uh, what we're really trying to work out at this point in time uh, is the relative um, uh, protection uh, that the vaccines provide for children. But I think we're very confident that vaccines would protect children to a high degree. But the second thing you need to know with all vaccines is about safety. And this is the question that JCVI are rightly taking time to make sure they get all the data before they give final advice. Because for any vaccine, what you want to be confident of uh, is that the uh, benefits of the vaccine outweigh any risks of the vaccine uh, for the children involved. Uh, and this is true also, obviously, for adults. Because children have had such a much lower rate uh, of severe outcomes from COVID, and this is one of the few good things uh, with COVID, they have a much, very much lower rate of uh, poor outcomes, uh, with the exception of a small number of children who've got uh, things like neurodisability. Uh, therefore, we would need to have even greater confidence about the safety because the risk benefit is potentially therefore going to be more marginal. So that's the reason why uh, JCVI is rightly taking its time to get the evidence from around the world so that when we give advice, uh, we can either say with confidence that it is safer for children to be vaccinated uh, than to get infection, uh, or alternatively, the other way round. But uh, that, that data are, is, is coming in uh, and will come in from other, other nations which are uh, going a little ahead of the UK uh, in terms of vaccinating children. Thanks, Anita. Let's go to the uh, media. Vicky Young, BBC News. Prime Minister, you said you wanted to be honest with people and you've talked about the expected rise in cases, more people in hospital and sadly more will die. Can you tell us how bad you expect it to get after uh, July and the restrictions being lifted? And to Professor Whitty, are you confident that hospitals can cope with this wave of cases? And to all three of you, in what circumstances would you continue to wear a mask? Uh, well, thanks, Vicky. I, th I think the, the answer is that obviously we have to uh, be cautious, and we will continue to to look at all the the data as we uh, as we as we progress. Uh, but don't forget that we always did uh, say there would be a, a a third a third wave, and uh, and the projections when we outlined the roadmap were uh, for uh, sadly more hospitalisations 
uh, and uh, sadly, uh, more, more deaths. I think the, the question that people have to ask themselves, as, as I said earlier on, is if we don't uh, go ahead now when uh, we, we've clearly done so much with the vaccination programme to, to break the link between infection and, uh, and, and death, uh, if we don't go ahead now when the uh, summer fire break is, is coming up, the, the, the school holidays, all the advantages that that should give us in, in fighting the virus, then the question is, when would we go ahead, um, uh, particularly given the, the, the likelihood the virus will have an extra advantage in the colder months in the autumn and, and the winter? So uh, we, we'd run the risk of either opening up at, uh, uh, at a very difficult time when the virus has an edge, has an advantage in, uh, in the colder months, or, uh, again, putting everything off uh, to, to next year. So um, I do think it's, a, it's going to be a very balanced decision next week. I want to stress that this is, a, this is what, what we're really doing today, is setting out the, the, the conditions that we expect the, uh, uh, us all to be in uh, from July the 19th. We're not taking the final decision until, until July the 12th. And on your, your, your question about, um, uh, you know, will I, will I personally wear a mask? I think that, uh, as I said earlier on, it will depend on the on the circumstances. And I, I, I think that what we're trying to do is move from a government, universal government diktat to uh, relying on people's personal responsibility. And clearly there's a, a big difference between uh, traveling on a crowded tube train and sitting uh, late at night in a, uh, a, you know, a virtually empty uh, carriage uh, on, 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 on uh, the main railway line. So I, I, what, what we want to do is uh, for people to exercise their personal responsibility, but to remember the value of, of face coverings, both in protecting themselves and, and others. But um, I know that Chris and Patrick want to add to that. Shall I answer the NHS question? Yes, sorry. And then I'll talk about uh, my view, Mark's mask. Patrick will add his. Um, I mean, the NHS is an emergency service, so at one level, the answer is it will cope with anything because it is an emergency service. Uh, but uh, we, as uh, Sir Patrick pointed out, um, the, uh, there is now a doubling time for uh, numbers of cases going into hospital. Uh, the number of uh, cases that's going in a day at the moment is relatively low compared to previous waves, that are around about 300. But if you double up and then double up and then double up and double again, at a certain point you get, and in fact in a surprisingly small number of doublings, you get to really quite high numbers. So the question is at what stage along this path uh, are the doublings times get, getting to the point when the numbers are very high before we actually uh, lead to uh, a reduction because um, the, uh, the, the peak of the epidemic happens. Uh, and what the modelling would imply uh, is that we will uh, reach that peak before we get to the point uh, where we have the kind of pressures we saw in January, for example, of this year. But inevitably, uh, with all models, you have to say there is some degree of uncertainty. And so, you know, we are dealing with uncertainty and uh, the Prime Minister and Ministers are having to make difficult decisions uh, with uncertainty as part of, uh, part of the decision process. In terms of uh, wearing a mask, uh, I would uh, wear a mask under three uh, situations uh, and I would do so uh, particularly uh, at this point when the epidemic is clearly significant and rising. Uh, and the first is in any situation which was indoors and crowded or indoors with close proximity to other people. Uh, and that is because masks help protect other people. This is a thing we do to protect other people, as it's by far its principal aim. The second situation I do it is if I was required to, uh, by any competent authority, I would have no hesitation about doing that. Uh, and I would consider that was a reasonable and sensible thing if they had good reasons to do that. And the third reason is if someone else was uncomfortable if I did not wear a mask, as a point of common courtesy, of course I would wear a mask. So under all those circumstances, I would do so. Uh, yeah, I, I've not really not got much to add. I, I, I'm exactly the same in terms of mask wearing. And just a reminder, masks are most effective at preventing somebody else catching the disease from you. They have some effect to prevent you catching it as well. And the situation you're most likely to catch COVID in is indoors, crowded spaces. So that's the obvious place where mask wearing becomes an advantage. Great, thank you. Uh, Romilly Weeks, ITV.
If I could ask uh, Professor Witte, first of all, we're only three quarters of the way through the vaccination programme. Cases are at the highest level since February. Why not finish vaccinating all adults before this significant unlocking. And to the Prime Minister as well, many scientists and doctors' organisations are suggesting that measures like mask wearing must be kept in place in order to alleviate pressure on the NHS. Why are you ignoring their concerns? I mean, on the first one, I mean, uh, first, to make the obvious point that decisions are made by ministers, not by scientific advisors or medical advisors. Uh, but within the scientific uh, views on this, there was a really clear consensus uh, that uh, under all circumstances, some degree uh, of um, uh, further social distancing will be maintained, need to be maintained even after the, uh, the, uh, the restrictions are lifted in law. And that's been part of the roadmap all the way through. And that is widely supported by the scientific uh, views. There was a pretty high degree of scientific agreement that the delay of four weeks that ministers chose to take was an extremely sensible thing to do. And I think the fact that uh, things are played out as they have, I think, reinforces that. Uh, but the view uh, is, is more mixed about exactly what the right timing is from a technical point of view, even before you get into uh, issues that uh, the Prime Minister has to deal with more widely. Uh, and these really come from the fact that at a certain point you move to the situation where instead of actually averting hospitalisations and deaths, uh, you move over to just delaying them. So you're not actually changing the number of people who will go to hospital or die, you may change uh, when they happen. Uh, and there is quite a strong view that, uh, that um, by many people, uh, including myself actually, that uh, going in the summer uh, has some advantages, all other things being equal, to opening up into the autumn when schools are going back uh, and we're when we're heading into the winter period uh, when uh, the NHS tends to be under greatest pressure for many other reasons. So it's a, very, it's a very much more difficult technical decision now, even before ministers have to grapple with all the other things, than it was in terms of the four-week delay, where I think there was a very substantial degree of scientific agreement. And, and Romney, just on your point about masks, I, I, I return to what we're trying to do with step four of the roadmap, which is, is get away from uh, government legal uh, diktat to uh, relying on personal responsibility. And I do think that there's a... I will, I will obviously wear a mask in uh, crowded places where you're meeting people that you, that you, do, you don't know, as, as, uh, as Chris was saying, uh, to, to protect others and uh, as, a ma as a matter of, uh, of simple... Uh, simple courtesy, uh, but uh, there's a difference between that, and I think everybody can understand that, and uh, circumstances where you're finding yourself sitting alone for hours uh, late at night uh, on, on a train uh, with no one else in the, in the compartment. There, and there I think people should be entitled uh, to exercise uh, some, some discretion. Uh, Beth Rigby, Sky News. Thank you. Prime Minister, you promised a cautious but irreversible route out of lockdown. And now you're about to get rid of all restrictions, a big bang approach, even as, to quote Chris Whitty there, we're in the face of an increasing epidemic, so the need to act accordingly to limit transmission, and yet you're doing away with all those safeguards. I put it to you that many people see that not as cautious, but as reckless. And I also put it to you that you just don't seem to be committing to irreversibility either. You just said that you will do everything possible uh, to avoid reimposing restrictions in the winter. So is this cautious or irreversible? And to Professor Whitty, you said at the beginning of the year it might be necessary to reintroduce some restrictions over the winter. What is your view of that now, given the Delta variant and the vaccine? You said that back in January and so much has changed. And does the big bang unlock in this summer now make more restrictions in the winter more or less likely in your view? Uh, well, Beth, I, I think that, uh, you know, with great respect, obviously, to, to you, you know, we, 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 you can't say that I'm being uh, both incautious and, uh, and also abandoning ir irreversibility. But what we want to do is uh, strike the right balance. And uh, we are trying to move from a, a system of a very elaborate government uh, rules to one in which we rely on people to exercise personal responsibility to, to follow guidance, mindful that, as I say, this pandemic is, is far from over. What we have achieved uh, with the vaccine rollout has put us in a, a, a very strong uh, position by comparison with, uh, with many other countries in terms of the, the wall of protection uh, that we have. 
but we must remain, uh, we must remain cautious. And uh, I think that that's why uh, you know, the, I, I'm asking people uh, to, to, to think in that way. This is, this is, I don't want people to feel that this is, uh, as it were, the moment to get uh, demob happy. This is the end of, the, uh, of COVID. It is very far uh, from the end of, uh, of dealing with this virus. And I, and I hope that that's been clear from everything uh, that you've heard from, the, uh, from the, this press conference today. And on the, on the irreversibility point, obviously, if we do uh, find another variant that uh, uh, doesn't respond to the, to the vaccines, if, uh, heaven you know, forbid, uh, some really awful new uh, bug should appear, then clearly uh, we will have to take whatever steps uh, we need to do to protect the public. But on balance, given the, the massive success of the vaccine rollout, uh, given the, the fact that uh, you, you're, this is a, a propitious moment, a, a good moment to, to do it, given the, uh, the, uh, the coming summer holidays, the, the natural fire break we have there, and, and, and given the, the difficulty of then imagining us opening up uh, in the context of the, the colder autumn uh, winter months, I think this is uh, a, a balanced and a, and a cautious approach. Uh, in terms of, you asked two questions. I mean, the, on the first one about uh, the winter, I, I felt at the time I made a deeply uncontroversial statement, which is respiratory infections are more likely to surge in the winter. That seems to be true for uh, the great majority for a lot of obvious uh, and or some less obvious reasons. Uh, so the winter is inevitably going to be tricky. And this winter, the NHS is likely to have both COVID and some resurgence of other respiratory viruses that were suppressed by the degree of lockdown last time round. So I think we should be realistic. Then this coming winter may be very difficult uh, for the NHS, and I don't think that's a particularly controversial statement. Uh, in terms of uh, things now which would make that more or less likely, I think the thing which is uh, against us, unfortunately, uh, is not so much decisions by government, but the Delta variant is more transmissible. Uh, and that does make life uh, more tricky. Anything that was difficult before gets that much more difficult with a more transmissible virus. Thanks, thanks, Beth, very much. Uh, Jane Merrick, the eye. And quickly. Jane, are you there? Um, yes, sorry. Thank you, Prime Minister. Um, first of all, there was a study last week from UCL that was published showing the incredible mental health and education attainment damage to children. So can you guarantee that even if you have to reimpose any restrictions next winter, there will not be school closures en masse? And to Professor Whitty or Sir Patrick, um, do secondary school age children need to be part of the vaccination programme in order to achieve population immunity? Thanks very much, Jane. On, on your, your really good point about the damage to children's education, uh, we are doing uh, everything we can to, to minimise that. We've got a, a, a massive catch-up plan, as you, as you know. But I think what a lot of people want to see, a lot of parents, a lot of teachers, a lot of pupils want to see is uh, a different approach to uh, outbreaks in, in schools and uh, we, we, are, we will be making sure this, uh, the, uh, the Secretary for Education will be uh, announcing uh, later this week how we're going to move away from uh, the, the sending bubbles home, uh, move away from, uh, from uh, contact isolation uh, for pupils, so, to, so to greatly to reduce uh, the impact on schools of, uh, of, of COVID outbreaks in, in, in those schools. And, uh, and obviously the way forward is, uh, is by testing uh, rather than sending the bubbles home. But, uh, Patrick's Patrick. Patrick. Yeah, um, on, the, on the vaccine, um, clearly the higher proportion of the population vaccinated, the greater the protection against spread. Um, and that's just true across all parts of the uh, population. But the question in children is the one that Chris addressed early on, earlier on, which is the relative risks to the individual from vaccination versus the relative benefits in terms of avoiding problems associated with COVID. And that is the balance which JCVI need to strike in terms of getting data on those comparative risks for children. Um, the higher the degree of immunity across the population, the greater the barrier to spread. But that's a different question from which children should be vaccinated and when, which we need to wait for the JCVI to um, give us views on. Thanks, Jane. Mesa Hall, The Express. 
Uh, thank you, Prime Minister. Um, Professor Whitty, if I could ask you first, you talked about the possibility of resurgence of other respiratory diseases this winter. Can you see any prospect of COVID-style restrictions, such as school closures or maybe compulsory masks, being used to protect the NHS from being overwhelmed by flu cases? And um, Prime Minister, you talked about employers starting to organise a safe return to work for employees who've been working from home. Um, some businesses would like to hear a very strong message that people need to get back to city centres to uh, get the economy going again. Do, do you, is your message to people to, to now get back to the office or, or once, the, uh, once we go ahead with ending the roadmap? And, and is the end of your roadmap, are you optimistic that that is the point that the economy will start roaring back into life? Uh, I don't think society has ever suggested that we should, in the face of seasonal flu, be doing, taking the kind of really uh, strong measures that were necessary for a pandemic uh, of the scale of COVID. Now, obviously, if there was a flu pandemic, uh, if we think back to the 1918-19 flu pandemic, that was something that was on a really colossal scale. That's a different situation. But for the seasonal flu, flu that we deal with every year, uh, I would be very surprised if society was wanting that to happen. But what we have demonstrated is that by simple measures, uh, which we really must stick to for COVID, washing hands, uh, covering mouth when coughing, all those things like that, uh, we really must be doing those and doing thing, and anything we do which helps to reduce the risk of COVID to ourselves, our families and those around us will also reduce the risk of other respiratory infections, including flu. Yeah, Mesa, so just on your, on your couple of points, the, the key thing is the government is, is no longer telling people that it's necessary uh, that they should work from home. Uh, and uh, the rest is really for, uh, for employees, employers to, uh, to, to work out for, uh, for themselves. But that change has been made possible by the, the success of the, of the vaccine rollout. The, the overwhelming uh, proportion of the, of the workforce that had now had, had two jabs. And don't forget that by the 19th, I think every, everybody uh, over 40 uh, will have had, uh, had two jabs. Everybody over 18 uh, will have had one jab. So we're talking about a huge uh, wall of, uh, of immunity. And on the, uh, the um, recovery, uh, I think it will be a strong recovery. And you're, you're already starting to to see it, and that has been made possible by the certainties of the of the roadmap and and the vaccines. Last question from Tim Ross of, of Bloomberg. Prime Minister, uh, before we get to uh, July the nineteenth, there are some football matches coming up, and I just wondered what your message was really to football fans who are planning to celebrate and businesses who are planning to accommodate them. Are you concerned that in any way this could trigger some kind of super spreader event? We saw what happened with Cheltenham last year. And to Chris Whitty and Patrick Valance, um, we know that you model these things because you have released SAGE documents showing as much. This is quite a big moment for the country and transparency is pretty important. So can you level with us all now and say exactly how many excess deaths, extra deaths, these relaxations are likely to cause according to your best modelling estimates? Uh, Tim, I think my advice to everybody would be to, you know, to obviously to support England, uh, but uh, in, in a, enthusiastically, but in a responsible way. And uh, and the, the events at, uh, at Wembley uh, clearly have particular conditions attached to them, particularly te particular uh, testing uh, requirements, which you know we, we will insist on. Um, just a quick point on that. I mean, again, the risk of spreading is greatest indoors environments, and therefore. It's very often not the big outdoor environment itself. It's the indoor environments with crowded spaces around that that become the risk for spreading. And that's where most super spreading events have occurred in those sorts of environments. In terms of the modelling, everything is made public. The models that have been done at the start of the roadmap and subsequently are there for people to see. They are just models and therefore you have to take uh, with some caution the absolute amounts. There's very wide uncertainty around it. What I will say is the modelling has been really quite accurate in terms of timing of the onset of this wave and we are due more modelling next week um, in the run-up to the decision on the 12th and that will be made public in the usual way. Great. Thanks, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you.
There we are, uh, Boris Johnson effectively saying that the days of COVID restrictions are over from July the 19th, or hopefully, he said, they were over. The pandemic, though, was far from over, he said at the beginning. Uh, cases are rising, hospitalizations are rising, and there are still deaths. Uh, but he said we paused step four to get more jabs in people's arms, and we've done that, and we wanted to make sure that the vaccine broke that link between hospital and death, and they have, he said. So we have to be honest that if we can't reopen society in a couple of weeks on July the 19th, when can we? And then he set out this effectively a five-point plan for uh, the future. One, vaccines, uh, the increase, uh, uh, well, the push will continue on vaccines. Um, two, and the big one, they'll move away from legal restrictions like face coverings and indoor hospitality and enforced working from home. Uh, the legal restrictions will go. There will be guidance, uh, he said. Three, they'll continue test, trace and isolate. That will be different for those with uh, two jabs and for children, and those details will become clear in the future. Uh, four, maintain the tough border controls. Again, flexibility for those with double jabs. That will be announced in uh, uh, the coming days or weeks. And then five, they'll continue to monitor the data and, if needed, alter uh, guidance. Let's bring in our political editor.